to this dialogue um, between civil society and the IMS Independent Evaluation Office. Uh, my name is Emma Bergesser. I'm with the Bretton Woods Project. And so um, today's session is really about exchanging views between um, the IEO and, and to learn about its work. And for the and it's an opportunity for the IEO to learn about um, civil society perspectives on its work and, and that of the IMF. Um, this session is, is usually, we try to organize this session during the Civil Society Policy Forum, during the World Bank and IMF Spring and Annual Meetings in person, but of course now that's, that's not possible. Um, so we're trying out this online format and hopefully maybe it's given the opportunity to a few folks who, who might not be able to um, join the, the meetings in person to join this meeting instead. So. Um, with that, so today what we're going to do is have a, a short presentation by Charles Collins, the director of the IEO, and Charles is going to share more about what the IEO does and how it works, some of its current work, and in particular some of its upcoming um, work as well, and, and what it might look at in the future. Um, and then we're going to go to uh, an open dialogue where everyone can ask questions, comments, uh, raise concerns, um, and we should have plenty of time um, for that. Uh, we'll get to that when we open the discussion, but um, for now, if you, um, during the discussion, if you can um, uh, type an asterisk into the chat box, then I'll be able to call on you uh, in order, and it would be great if you can turn your camera on if you do have the floor, um, but it's not, you know, necessary. Um, and also, I thought I would just share at this point that um, we're very keen for everybody to, to share their views today and, and to have as much time as possible for that. But we're also aware that these types of sessions, you know, usually there's a bunch of questions at the end, and we would hate for some folks not to have their their turn or their their views heard so at the end of the session we're going to be sharing a form that um, basically gives you more space um, to comment or or ask any other questions on anything that charles is presenting today or or any other issues that you might like to raise um, and so um, there'll be another opportunity for, for you to, to share your thoughts uh, after the session as well. Um, and then finally, I think you heard this session is being recorded to help us with note taking. Unless there's anybody here who would rather not, uh, who is not comfortable with that, please share that now and then we'll revert back to old fashioned note taking. I, all right, I don't think there's anyone with a concern, so so the session will be recorded then. Um, and so that, that leaves me to just give the floor to, to Charles um, and to share his presentation. And Charles, if you could also perhaps introduce your colleagues as well so we know who's on the call from the IEO, that would be great. Sure. Thank you. Uh, well, thank, thanks so much, Emma, and the Bretton Woods Partnership for helping us to organize uh, this, this meeting. Uh, welcome everybody. I think we have uh, a pretty good uh, participation. It's, 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 it's hard to see from the squares on my screen exactly all the people participating, uh, but it, the participation list included people uh, from around the world, from, from the US obviously, but UK, Europe, uh, but also Africa, Asia, Latin America. So indeed, this is one of the advantages uh, of going virtual is, is that we were able to have a much broader uh, participation and, and dialogue, so we, we very much welcome that. Uh, I also have uh, many IEO colleagues uh, participating. Uh, I won't introduce them all, but I, I think we certainly have the, the heads of all the uh, evaluations uh, and also most of the, most of the team members who, who I think also uh, will, will be happy to, to join in and participate. Uh, this is actually our, our first uh, dialogue with civil society in six months. Uh, back last March, we, we hunkered down like everybody else in the face of the, the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, since then, we've been working away diligently uh, uh, on our evaluations. Uh, 
but we we felt it was important to start to reconnect uh, with our our friends and supporters in in civil societies. Uh, so uh, this is an important step for us. Uh, external communication uh, is an you know, important part of 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 what we do, uh, and it's, it's always excellent to hear your your thoughts and suggestions. Uh, as Emma said, I'll give a brief presentation at the start. Uh, basically, I'll talk briefly about what is the IEO and, and how are we structured, what have we done, but then spend more of my time on our current work agenda, how it's being affected uh, by the pandemic, uh, talk briefly about our, our, our future work agenda and some of the challenges that, that we face, and then, then we'll open it up for discussion and, and comments from you. So I'm very much looking forward uh, to hearing uh, from you at, at, during the meeting. I think we can uh, go on till, uh, for an hour and a half, so it's 10.30 uh, Eastern Standard Time, uh, and hopefully that will provide a good, good, uh, good opportunity for everyone to, to speak. Um, Arun, could you uh, launch our, the, the presentation. This may take a couple of moments um, to get onto the screen. Um, you know, basically, I thought it'd be helpful to start with a, just a short primer on what is the IEO, uh, what do we do, um, for those of you who are less familiar uh, with our work. Uh, the IEO was established in 2001. Uh, it was set up a couple of years after the Asia crisis, which was not just a crisis for Asia, but also a crisis for the IMF's credibility and, and legitimacy. And, and one of the steps that the fund took uh, to address these concerns was to set up uh, an independent office at the fund uh, to assess uh, funds work uh, and provide uh, recommendations on how to strengthen the fund's capacity to meet its its mandate. Uh, it has three specific uh, 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 components to its work. One is to, to strengthen the oversight role of the executive board. Uh, the executive board is, is, is typically overwhelmed by the day-to-day the -day task uh, of uh, uh, reviewing and approving uh, fund operations. And they very much value having uh, a team like us taking a deeper look uh, at the work that the fund does and, and really giving them a, a lever uh, to, to push fund management and, and staff uh, to, to, to strengthen activities. Um, Arun, I presume you're trying to put on the full screen uh, version of the PowerPoint, not, not the one with the notes. Um, Yes, we should be on the, the primer, the next, the next page. Um, so the second function, that's the right page. I think you have the full screen version of that, uh, getting there. So we support board oversight. Uh, secondly, we are uh, tasked with enhancing institutional learning from, from experience, helping the fund to uh, uh, bring new ideas from, from outside. Uh, to learn from what it has done, uh, to break down uh, silos in the institution, to to combat groupthink. I think this is a you know, very very important role uh, that we play at the IO. And then thirdly, uh, we're bouncing around here a bit. Thirdly, we are tasked with strengthening external credibility of the fund by increasing the transparency uh, of of the fund. It, it, it can be a somewhat bewildering black box. And our reports, I think, really help to uh, shed light on, on how the fund works, what it does, why it does some things, uh, why it may not do other things so, so well. And our, our work is often used by professors in teaching courses about, about the IMF. Uh, let me stress that our role is, is about evaluation, uh, about how well the fund does in meeting its broad objectives set out in the Articles of Agreement. Uh, we're not an auditor, uh, an inspector, or a watchdog in the sense that we're, we're not trying to assess whether the fund follows the rules or follows its procedures, but rather think more broadly about how the fund 
can fulfill its mandate uh, more, more effectively. And then finally, the final point is that the IMF, the IEO is a, intended as a catalyst for change. Uh, we're not just a research shop, we, we hope we do high quality research, but the idea is to affect the institution, the way it behaves, uh, its ability to meet its objectives. Uh, and for this reason, there's a very robust follow-up process to our reports, which I'll, I'll come to in, in a minute. Uh, Arun, if we go to the next page, please. Uh, so that the the next page uh, is about the governance framework for the IEO. Uh, it's very important for us to be effective that we are indeed uh, fully independent and perceived as as fully independent. And I'm I'm pleased that we have a very robust uh, structure uh, that allows us to be autonomous, independent of IMF management and staff uh, and operating at arm's length from the executive board. Uh, I'm the director, I'm appointed by the board for a non-renewable six-year term, and I'm fully responsible for topic selection, uh, for the content of the reports and, and the hiring of staff. Most of our staff uh, come from outside. They're not, they're not full-time IMF staff members, although many do have experience of working either on the staff or uh, on the executive board. Uh, we have access to all internal information uh, with very limited exceptions. So we, we can see documents, uh, we can interview staff members. Uh, in, in general, this has worked, worked very well, although sometimes there, there have been some challenges. Uh, we have a separate budget. Uh, which is subject to board approval. We, we, we cannot be, be punished uh, for saying things that, that management or staff may, may, may not appreciate. Uh, and we also have an external review every five years or so uh, of how we are doing. Uh, the evaluators themselves get evaluated. This is actually very important for us. It's a, it's a, it's a check on, on whether we are indeed achieving the independence that we aim to achieve. Uh, whether we're having producing the high quality reports uh, and whether we're having an impact on the institution. And these external reviews also provide an opportunity to think about how to further strengthen uh, the governance framework. Uh, next slide, please. So the, this, this slide gives us a sense of how uh, the, the scale of the IAO uh, relative to other evaluation offices in other IFIs. Uh, we actually are, are very small. We're only one half percent of the fund's total administrative budget, uh, which is considerably smaller uh, than other uh, evaluation offices. We have a, a small staff of, of only 15 full-time staff members augmented with, with consultants. Uh, which means that we can only produce uh, two or three reports a year, which is much, much less uh, than the other evaluation offices. Uh, but we think we can have just as much impact uh, because each of the reports gets a lot of attention uh, from the board, from management and staff, and it's a very robust follow-up process. And if we were to produce more reports, I think that it would inevitably dilute the impact of, of each report uh, as the absorptive capacity for our, our work uh, in the institution is, 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 is constrained, as, which means we have to be very strategic in choosing the evaluations that we do uh, to make sure that they are on topics that are important to the institution, uh, where there are concerns, uh, and where an evaluation can, can help the fund to do better. Uh, having said that, let's move to the next slide. Uh, which will give you a, a sense of the work that we that we have been doing um, in recent years. Uh, last year, we did two major reports, uh, first on IMF advice uh, on unconventional monetary policies, po policies followed by the major central banks over the past 10 years, uh, and also the impact uh, of those policies, the spillovers uh, on countries around the world and concerns that, ha that have been raised. Uh, we also did a major report on 
fund's financial surveillance and the extent to which it's been able to increase its capacity to do high quality financial surveillance since the global financial crisis. Uh, the previous couple of years, we did two reports, which, which I think got a lot of attention from civil society. One is on the IMF's uh, work with, with fragile states uh, and, uh, and conflict affected states, uh, where the, the fund is, is challenged by, by difficult circumstances, uh, high degree of political volatility, weak institutions. Uh, does the fund make big an impact to these important countries as it should? And then also the IMF and, and social protection, as the fund is increasingly uh, commented on, provided advice on social protection policies, policies to protect the vulnerable and the poor, uh, does the fund giving sensible, coherent advice? Um, we also uh, do updates, which are much shorter, less resource intensive, uh, uh, look back at earlier uh, evaluations to see what has happened in the years since the evaluations were done. So last year we did uh, an update on the IMF and trade policy evaluation uh, from 2009. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in terms of the impact uh, on the fund, uh, I believe that we actually have a very substantial impact, uh, far greater than would be suggested by the very small amount of resources that are put into the institution. Uh, I can point to a number of important board approved policies uh, that have been approved in, in recent years. Uh, many of you may see this, the new strategic framework for IMF engagement on social spending issues uh, that was produced uh, in response to our social protection evaluation. Uh, there's a major new strategy on, on data and statistics uh, that comes out of an evaluation done three years ago uh, on the fund's work on, on statistics. Uh, and similarly, uh, new frameworks for working with, with currency unions and regional financial arrangements that came out of a euro area crisis evaluation. Now, it does take time for these new frameworks and policies to be put in place. Uh, I think that's that's inevitable. So we, we are required to be, be somewhat patient. Uh, and, but I think it's also a, 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 a sign of, of the, you know, the seriousness and depth of the response uh, that, uh, that b between the launching of, of, of an evaluation and, and the impact, there, there, there can be some, some lag. Uh, we also uh, see uh, significant improvements in the fund's capacity and practices. Uh, so, for example, the fragile states evaluation was was followed by uh, substantial steps to increase the staff working on these countries, uh, to increase the capacity development work on these countries, uh, to provide better incentives for staff uh, to engage with these countries, to make sure that the staff uh, had the capacity to really help these countries, which are so different from your, your standard uh, advanced economy. Uh, that is the, you know, has been the bread and butter of fund work. And similarly, there's been uh, a lot of work over the last year or so on, on deepening the funds financial and monetary policy expertise uh, to address some of the shortcomings that we identified in our, our reports on financial surveillance uh, and on unconventional monetary policies. If we go to the next slide, please, Arun. Um, I mentioned that we have a very robust follow-up mechanism. Uh, in brief, our reports are all discussed by the executive board. They, they comment on the recommendations that we make. Uh, those recommendations that are endorsed by the executive board need to be followed by uh, an action plan uh, that has to be approved by the executive board. And those action plans, management implementation plans, or MIPS, are then monitored by our Office of Internal Audit uh, at the fund. And there's a monitoring report uh, that is provided uh, each year to the board. It's, it's also published uh, on, on the fund's website. Uh, and it gives a very detailed accounting of the extent to which actions have actually been uh, moved forward. 
this uh, slide here comes from the, the last monitoring report that covers the last 10 implementation plans, 115 actions. And you'll see that the, the degree of implementation is, is, is quite good, particularly of, of the more recent plans. Um, around 60% of the actions were actually completed. Uh, about 20% are, are on track. That, that still leaves a, a sizable number of actions that are still incomplete and, and stalled. And the monitoring report uh, does an analysis of, of why things uh, have, in some cases, been stalled, and it identifies an, a, number, a number of problems, uh, inadequate incentives, uh, technical issues, uh, poorly defined measures of success, for example. Uh, uh, we are concerned uh, about this shortfall. The board is concerned, uh, and in fact, our our last external evaluation led by Donald Kabaruka uh, pushed for action to deal with this with this backlog. And an action indeed was taken uh, by the board earlier this year uh, to review the backlog and to prioritize items. Uh, that needed to be reinforced. Uh, as you see from the slide, uh, uh, nine of the 24 items uh, are to be reinforced. Uh, the other items will be retired from this monitoring process, but are still important, uh, but will be covered in, in other uh, fund review processes. We don't need to focus on everything uh, at the IO. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the COVID crisis uh, was you know, a, a major shock uh, to, to global health, a major shock to the global economy, uh, requiring a, a massive IMF frontline response. And I'm sure you're all well aware uh, that the fund has been extremely busy. Uh, it's provided emergency financing uh, to over 75 countries uh, over the past few months to help countries deal uh, with the health and economic crisis. Uh, there's also been a, a lot of work reviewing fund policies and fund financing uh, to make sure that the fund is fully capable of supporting its members at these very difficult times. Uh, this uh, focus has meant inevitably, I think, some delays uh, in evaluation pipeline. Uh, a couple of our reports that were to be discussed at the board and, and published uh, have had to be delayed uh, by by a few months, um, but they they will be coming shortly, as as I will uh, mention in, in a few moments. Uh, so we continued with our own work, our in our uh, on our work agenda, as as well as as looking back uh, at our old evaluations to see whether there were some lessons from from other evaluations for the current crisis, which. Uh, we, sh we shared uh, with the fund, and sort of the main the main point is, is that it, uh, the fund is typically uh, quite good at responding vigorously and energetically to the immediate needs. Uh, but it's also important for the fund to to think forward and, and to think uh, how to make sure that its toolkit is adequate to the purposes, and that it has adequate financial resources, and the policies going ahead uh, are. Uh, uh, helpful to uh, ensure a, a, a strong recovery, as well as to to stabilize the the, the very negative uh, immediate consequences of the pandemic. Meanwhile, we've continued to work on our our ongoing evaluations, but adapting them uh, to reflect the the new challenges from the pandemic. Uh, and we've been thinking and learning how to adapt our own work practices to the new environment. Uh, particularly the fact that that uh, travel is is now impossible uh, for the foreseeable future, so we've been having to do our work uh, uh, through virtual communications, like like the seminar, uh, which is you know it's a, it's a challenge when you're doing a country case study, uh, but we found that uh, in practice, uh, the our, our consultants have been able to continue the work quite quite effectively. Uh, despite the, the new constraints. Uh, we're also beginning to think about a future evaluation uh, of the IMF's uh, COVID-19 response and how that would be structured, what would be the issues that we would cover, and I'll, I'll come back to that 
in a few moments. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so it's just briefly going over our, our current agenda. Uh, there are two reports that were to have been already reviewed by the board and, and published, uh, but have been delayed by a few months. Uh, first on IMF advice on capital flows. Uh, in fact, that uh, evaluation is going to go to the board next week. Uh, so it should be published uh, late September, early October. Uh, sneak preview, uh, the fund uh, has, I think, uh, strengthened its work on giving advice on capital flows uh, since a new institutional view was adopted in 2012 uh, that provided somewhat greater flexibility for the for the fund's advice, for example, on using uh, capital flow measures, capital controls to deal with volatile capital flows. Uh, however, there's a need to refresh this, this framework uh, to reflect country experience uh, to reflect uh, ongoing research uh, being done by by academics and also by the fund fund itself, um, we also uh, suggest that there's a need to take a greater account of of distribution issues, the impact of capital account liberalisation uh, on on inequality and and distribution, which was a, a topic that got very little attention back in 2012, and there's also important to take more attention to how the policies in the uh, source countries, the countries originating the capital flows, uh, can affect the countries that are receiving the capital flows. The, the weight of adjustment should not just be on the countries being affected by capital flow volatility. Uh, second, uh, we have an evaluation of the funds collaboration with the World Bank on macrostructural issues that includes issues like climate, uh, inequality, gender, uh, issues where the fund has been ramping up its activity over the past few years, recognizing the macro importance of these issues, but also issues where the fund does not have deep expertise uh, and where there's been uh, some uh, interest in, in working more closely with the World Bank uh, that has a lot more experience and expertise. Uh, this report will go to the board hopefully in, in November. Uh, the, the sneak preview bottom line is, is that as the collaboration has been fairly patchy, uh, it's been to a large extent based more on, on personal relationships than on institutional structures, uh, which I think has, has limited the, the fund's impact in these areas. Uh, there's a problem of, of conflicting messages uh, sometimes, uh, so we, we we recommend that actions need to be taken to provide a more institutional approach to collaboration with the World Bank, and particularly in areas where it's strategically important for the fund to work closely with the World Bank. Issues like like climate, where the, the where the fund is now ramping up uh, its its work. Uh, given increasing recognition of the importance of, 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 uh, of climate change. Then we have three uh, evaluations in progress. Uh, first, uh, an evaluation on, on a perennial topic for the fund, a perennial challenge for the fund, is whether the uh, financial support it provides to countries in support of programs uh, is paying adequate attention uh, to countries' uh, need to uh, protect uh, uh, the economy from the impact of adjustment and, and to strengthen growth pro prospects at the same time as needed adjustment for external stability is, is being pushed. This, this issue has become even more important uh, in the wake of the pandemic. Uh, which will most likely create very large adjustment needs uh, in, in a number of countries that have been severely damaged, uh, but at the same time has has damaged these countries' growth models. Uh, so we, we think this is a very important topic and we, we aim to complete this evaluation next year. Uh, we're also doing a, a deeper dive into the IMF's relationship with small states. Uh, it's about 20% of the membership. These are countries with populations more than 
one and a half million or, or less. Um, these are countries that have been particularly affected uh, by the pandemic. Many of them rely heavily on tourism, uh, many of them uh, with limited institutional capacity, and also countries that are, are affected by, by climate change. So that's a, an important topic. Uh, can the fund provide useful support to, to these small states as, as, as well as its, to its larger members? And then finally, we're, we're doing an evaluation on, on INF's capacity development work which is around a third of the, of the fund's operational budget. Uh, but there are you know, continuing questions about how much impact uh, the fund is, is making. Uh, and in particular, you know, how is the fund going to be able to adapt to the new challenges uh, created by the, by the pandemic? Uh, if we could move to the next slide, which I think is going to be the final, final slide. Uh, so future topics and issues that we're grappling with and here we're particularly interested to hear you hear your thoughts uh, firstly as i mentioned we're planning an evaluation of the imf response uh, to to covid-19 it's been a you know a very major task for the fund uh, one of the questions we should be looking at uh, as we evaluate the the fund's uh, work in this in this area uh, and what what approach should we should we take? Well, typically, what we do is we we wait for a number of years uh, to see how things play out uh, before we do an evaluation. Uh, one constraint we have is it's difficult for us to evaluate in, in an area where there's very rapid change, where where fund staff is 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 working hard and, and having to uh, to continually shift the way it approaches its task. Uh, but on the other hand, if we if we wait for too long. Then we're not really going to be very helpful by the time the evaluation is is complete. Um, other future topics we're considering, we, we always have a, a list uh, of of topics. If you go to our website, you'll 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 see the list we we put together last year. I would highlight three particular topics which I, I think will be important. Um, first will be uh, the funds work on on debt issues. Uh, certainly. A, a major concern, uh, the run up in debt over uh, the last few years has been very striking. And of course, the, the pandemic has made that situation uh, even worse. Um, this is an area where the fund is continuing to evolve its framework. So it's, it's not a topic we can launch into immediately. It's going to be something relevant for the, for the future. Uh, another topic that I think will be of interest to this group is is the fund's contribution on on governance and corruption issues. I think the fund has made increasing attention to the importance of these issues as having an impact uh, on macroeconomic performance of countries, as as well as more broadly on on countries' politics and, and societies. And an evaluation of this topic, I, I think, would be would be important and interesting. And and then finally, uh, an evaluation of what we call exceptional access cases that's cases that have of countries that have borrowed very large amounts from the fund where the risks are particularly large and where there's particular uh, potential for for political influence being being brought to bear so how, how does the fund go about uh, managing these risks while supporting countries that have particularly large balance of payments needs and then finally uh, we're looking forward to next year, which will be our 20th anniversary. Um, and I think that's going to be a good opportunity for us to, to look back and, and reflect and consider what can we do better? Uh, how can we improve? Uh, it'll be a year or so ahead of the, the fourth external evaluation. Um, and you know, we're always aware that there's room for us to learn from experience too. Um, three issues I, I mentioned here. Uh, first, is, is I think there's, you know, we always need to find the right balance between protecting our independence and also influencing the institution. I think there's there's a danger that you put too much weight on the in, on on independence, then you go retreat into an, an ivory tower, uh, and you you don't interact with with staff uh, or management or the, or the board uh, to to influence people. You really need to be in, in constant dialogue. Uh, but if you're in constant dialogue, then 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 there is a risk, perhaps, that, that you might be more 
uh, affected by by the views within the institution. So it's, it's important to be careful to to find the right balance in the trade off uh, between independence and influence. Um, second set of issues we'll, we'll need to reflect on how we're adjusting uh, to the COVID world. Hopefully, we'll be in a, a post COVID world, uh, but I think there will be permanent changes uh, to the way everyone uh, goes about doing their business. Much less reliance on on travel. Uh, much more um, use of, of virtual communications. And I think that that creates opportunities for us, uh, like the one we hopefully we're we're taking advantage of today, as as, as well as constraints. Uh, and then finally, an issue that I think is going to be very relevant um, is how we partner ourselves with other evaluation offices. Uh, we are encouraging the fund to form stronger partnerships with other uh, 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 multilaterals, uh, with aid agencies. Uh, but are we ourselves, do you think, how, we, how can we ourselves best partner uh, with evaluation offices, say the World Bank, the IEG, uh, all the MDBs have evaluation offices. And when the institutions are working together, I, I think it makes sense for uh, the evaluation offices to be working together as well. So those, those are some preliminary thoughts on what we, what we can do better, uh, what our future topics will be. But I very much look forward to hearing your thoughts. Uh, so I'm going to turn it back to Emma and maybe Arun can put our final slide up, uh, which gives some headshots of our of our team. Uh, Emma. Thank you. Back, back to you. Thank you so much, Charles, for that overview. I think that was really helpful. Um, so I'm actually going to change what I said at the beginning um, in terms of asking for the floor. I think it might be easier if people can click on the raising hand button that is next to your name in the participants list. I didn't realize that was going to be there. Um, so please start raising your hands now um, so we can start taking questions and comments. We already have um, two questions that were put there uh, uh, on the chat during your presentation. One um, is a bit easier, one um, maybe less. Um, so I'll start with those as people start raising their hands. Emma, um, can, I, can I just, just ask Arun to, to take the stop slide, stop sharing so we, we can all see each other again. Excellent. Great, thank right. you. Um, so the first question, and, and I'm sorry, I can't see who asked it because I'm, I'm having some technological issues, but um, first, will the presentation and record of um, this meeting be shared with the participants afterwards? Um, and second, there's some interest uh, to hear um, more about the lessons that you mentioned that the IEO is already um, sharing uh, with the IMF in terms of past crises. Um, that are relevant for the, for the COVID crisis. Is there anything perhaps uh, like a document or on paper that can be shared? Um, there's there's interest on 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 that front. I'll I'll start I'll stop there and as I'll take more questions. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Emma. Um, yes, I mean we'd we'd be happy to share the uh, the record of this of this meeting. I mean, maybe we could post it on our on our website and you can all get access to it from. From there, um, in terms of uh, the the lessons uh, from from past crises, uh, I think maybe I'll mention two lessons specifically from our evaluation of the fund's response to the to the global financial crisis in 2008, which I, I think is the, the most relevant. Uh, we did a, a extensive evaluation in 2014. Uh, of that crisis, and, and one, of, one of the points we made was that while the fund, I think, did very good work in terms of fighting back the crisis, at the immediate response uh, by providing uh, substantial amounts of financing to countries in need uh, and recognizing the, the need for that for, for, for degree of flexibility to move quickly uh, to allow countries to get access to necessary financing. Uh, there was a, a, a lack of foresight about how to move to the next stage. Uh, during the, the financial crisis, there was a massive 
uh, fiscal stimulus, monetary support uh, from the advanced economies. It was very helpful for the global economy, uh, but uh, that support was was unwound uh, uh, rather more quickly than 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 I think was sensible. Uh, particularly, if the, there was a, there was quite a rapid shift back towards fiscal consolidation. Uh, as uh, uh, policymakers worried about accumulation of debt, but I, I think there was less attention paid to what would be the consequences of fiscal consolidation uh, for the, uh, uh, the policy environment, in particular, the additional pressure would put on monetary policy, uh, on unconventional monetary policies, uh, which were uh, you know, really, really push central banks to increase even further their use of these instruments, which raised concerns uh, about spillovers. They were created uh, volatile capital flows, which are hard for emerging markets to manage. They also created financial stability risks, and they also probably contributed uh, to distributional issues uh, since you know, generated very high asset returns for, for the wealthy. Uh, but tended to, re to reduce uh, returns to uh, retirees, for example, relying on, on fixed income. Uh, so that, 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 that was one message. The second message uh, was the importance of ensuring that the fund has an adequate financial base of its own uh, to uh, provide the funding needed. Uh, it's clearly the fund's capacity to reassure the global economy that that it can fulfill its lender of last resort function depends on the fund being perceived as, as having uh, more than adequate resources. Uh, so the, the fund took a number of steps uh, after the crisis to to boost its resource base, it increased access to borrowed resources, uh, but it took a long time to increase quotas um, to get the political uh, support necessary. For that more fundamental increase in in funds resource base that that was needed, so th those are two lessons that we draw, which I, I think both of those are, are relevant to to the current situation. Great, thanks, Charles. Um, so I have a question from Monica Erwer. Um, do you want to? I know you typed it, but I would invite you to take the floor. Um, and after Monica, I have David Archer with Action Aid. Monica. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, hello, my name is Monica and I work uh, at an organization called Kvinnat Kvinna, in, based in Sweden. And we work in 20 countries and we work with 150 women's rights organizations all over. And uh, in relation to COVID, we have seen all our partners organizations are lifting out the effects considering gender-based violence and also the linkage to women's economic empowerment. So my question uh, was if that in your evaluation coming up in relation to COVID, if you have thought about looking at the IMF's packages and if that have had any impact, uh, positive or negative in terms of gender-based violence and women's economic empowerment. Uh, thanks Monica for that question. Um, it, you know, at this point, we're still very much in the early, early stages of, of thinking what might be important issues for that evaluation. So that's a helpful suggestion that that you've made. We'll, we'll, we'll certainly take that on on board. Uh, we have, uh, I mentioned this recent evaluation uh, on collaboration on macro structural issues. That that did cover the fund's work on on gender. Um, so we, you know, that's that's an issue that that has been on our on our radar screen. Uh, I think in in that uh, uh, evaluation, we we found that the fund has actually been working quite well with a broad range of institutions uh, beyond the World Bank. In, in many ways, the the, the, the fund found good partners uh, in. Uh, with 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 uh, civil society, with with research groups interested in gender issues, 
uh, so uh, you know there was, there was clear complementarity you know fund brings macroeconomic analytical skills but I, I, I think it, it doesn't have the direct first-hand experience of the issues uh, and understanding of the issues so you know I, 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 I would certainly hope that you know, in, in, in responding to the crisis, the, the fund is able to, to to bring on board the sort of perspectives that organizations like yours have. Uh, and that's potentially an issue that we, we could then look back on when we, when we eventually do the evaluation. Great. And Leo, uh, sorry, uh, David, and then I have um, uh, sorry, then I have uh, some more on the chat, but turns out I can't see your hands if you don't have your video screen on. So if you do want the floor, please do type an asterisk in the chat. Apologies for that. Um, David, go ahead. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, hi, Charles. Um, I am uh, just wanted to um, ask a question about, uh, we, we wrote you um, uh, back in July uh, asking uh, and raising concerns about IMF policy advice around public sector wage bills uh, and the impact that that is having uh, on constraining spending on particularly doctors, nurses, uh, teachers, often perhaps unintentionally. Um, the evidence that we had collected that 78 percent of countries uh, over the last uh, uh, three years where we had uh, were able to find the evidence had, had been advised to cut or uh, or freeze public spec, uh, spending on public sector wages uh, and some of the, uh, the the consequences of that, which I think have left countries uh, ill prepared for COVID in some cases. Um, and we have been increasingly concerned about the sort of internal biases and groupthink in this area. Now, thank you very much for your response to that letter, which we got at the end of August, a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, and you raised a couple of, uh, you know, and I know it's difficult to sort of put in place a whole new evaluation when you're only doing a couple in a year. Um, uh, and I think, you know, you raised two suggestions, one which was uh, to integrate this into the evaluation on adjustment and growth. And I would be very interested to hear your thoughts on how you might be able to do that most effectively. Um, and you also suggest that it might be uh, something to look at in, in, in the context of the COVID response, which I think also uh, makes sense, but I think it would be important that that review of the COVID response considers the impact of advice prior to COVID uh, on the preparedness of countries to, uh, uh, to to deal with the pandemic. So I'd be interested to hear where you think the best prospects are, how you might integrate concerns around public sector wage bills in the other evaluations. And of course, we'd slightly like to keep this on the radar as a possible future mm -hmm. issue for standalone evaluation uh, if those other evaluations don't pick this up uh, and right. deal with it. Right. Well, I, I particularly mention our evaluation on, on adjustment and growth, um, which will involve a, a series of, of country case studies. Uh, where consultants will be looking at countries that have had uh, fund support in, in recent years um, and have been implementing uh, fiscal adjustment. And, and, and one of the questions we ask is, is, is how is that fiscal adjustment uh, structured? Uh, and was it, was it done in a, in a way uh, that uh, limited the negative drag on the economy and in particular, uh, the negative impacts uh, on um, uh, uh, support for uh, uh, low-income groups for uh, uh, for for social issues like like health and education, and you know, I've, I've, this this work is is already around halfway complete, um, and I know that it, in, a, in a number of the case studies. Exactly the issue that that you raised does does come up. So I think that will help us to at least explore the issue and and you know, get it get a sense of of how it uh, has played out in, in particular contexts, um, and that could then provide the foundation for for further work in this area, say possibly in in this uh, COVID nineteen response evaluation, possibly in a future evaluation. I mean, when we choose topics, we we, we typically 
um, uh, listen to broad range of stakeholders. Uh, obviously, we, we talk to our executive board, to staff and management, but, but we also like to reach out uh, to groups like this to, to get a, a broad range of, uh, of, of ideas and concerns. So this, you know, this, our interaction with you has been, has been very helpful on this, on this front and we'll, we'll, we, are, we, are, we are taking this issue seriously and, and to see what we can, what we can contribute. Great, right, thanks. Um, so some more questions are taking are coming in. So maybe we should take two at a time, Charles, if that's all right with sure. you. Um, so we have Austin first, and then Leo after that. Leo Baunek. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Um, thank, thank you very much, Emma. So uh, my name is Austin. I work with the International Budget Partnership, um, the Nigeria Country Manager. Okay, I, I've got um, a proposal for a future topic for research and then I've got a question for uh, for Charles um, so um, so the, the the proposal I have for a future research is um, you know it, it has it has to do with the current response to the pandemic where the IMF is making available emergency funding um, for for developing and developed countries so um, but you, you find out that um, the IMF adopts a policy of undertaking an ex post audit. So an audit that happens after the lifespan of the financing. Uh, but civil society have been advocating for more frequent audits on a quarterly or biannual basis. And the reason for this is that, yes, there's the critical need to strike a balance between speed of response to the pandemic, as well as also ensuring that public funds are used in the most effective and efficient way. So I'd like to propose if the IEO could look at evaluating the limitations of the IMF's adoption of the ex post audit rather than a, a more frequent approach to auditing how countries are deploying this emergency financing. Now, the, the question I have has to do also with the issue of, you know, my, 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 my experience of most divisions within the fund is that there continues to be this tension about the kind of relationship the fund can have with external accountability actors, especially CSOs and citizens. Um, so, um, um, but it appears to me, listening to Charles, that the IEO seems to be best placed among all the arms of the IMF to better collaborate with external accountability actors. So I just wanted to learn about how have you been doing this, especially within the context um, framework, uh, the, the COVID-19 framework. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Leo? Thanks, Emma, and uh, thanks very much, Charles, and other IEO colleagues for the update. Um, you know, we're going to read with with great interest the uh, you know capital flows uh, paper in the context of what's happened with uh, you know dramatic swings and volatility in both directions, uh, inflows and outflows in emerging market economies from the past few months. Um, and and moreover, to to the point that I think you've already made. Uh, I agree that it's it's too early really to do a COVID-19 uh, evaluation because we're, we're right in the middle of it, but uh, those lessons from past crises are crucial. So so the question I had was, I was very interested to see the graph on, on kind of the numbers on, on implementation, but obviously not all recommendations, not all management um, action items are, are created equal and, and probably the ones that you raised on the question of unwinding um, and how that analysis is done, how the advice is uh, is prepared, is is probably the most important one uh, coming into the next uh, next few months uh, as the pandemic uh, and crisis uh, hopefully uh, crest. So I'd I'd like to hear kind of more specifically on those uh, post global financial crisis um, evaluations where implementation is at on those. Are those some of the ones that have been triaged? Uh, if so, how? Um, and uh, as more of more of a comment um, to 
you know, support an evaluation uh, on public wage bills or, and, and certainly an examination of it in the adjustment and growth uh, report to the extent that that is possible, uh, given how far along it is. You know, this is another thing that, you know, we can't quite maybe uh, examine COVID-19 yet, but this is a fundamental transmission mechanism between how, um, you know, the IMF policy advice and, and conditionality influence the ability of countries to react uh, to the crisis is the, the staffing levels of their hospitals, the funding for the public health care systems, uh, and the funding for their education systems um, as well. And I think that that matters uh, both in terms of crisis response, but also recovery. You know, what is the ability of countries to rebuild, um, to uh, have productive workforces, to be healthy and to, uh, to get out of this and, and be hopefully be resilient enough later. So um, this is a, you know, an overwhelming area of IMF policy advice that really hasn't been examined other than the paper from the Middle East and Central Asia Department, uh, which was quite thorough, but uh, you know, it's certainly um, it is not the level of detail or thoughtfulness that you typically see in Article 4 is that, that have a lot of influence on, uh, on how this happens. And uh, I would encourage that to, to be in the front of your minds as you think of all of this. Um, and then very quickly, I, I, will, I will say, at least in the last few years, I think there's a crucial difference between the IEO and, and the IEG, for example, which is that the IEG typically will evaluate as the starting point the implementation of you know, a pre-existing point of view. To what extent has the bank been able to implement uh, a point of view already laid out by bank management? And I think IEO, at least recently, has done a very good job of, of starting a step back um, from that and really looking uh, at the, you know, presuppositions, uh, <clears throat> being open to uh, critically examining the point of views of management. I think that was clear in social protection and, and was ultimately extremely productive uh, for management for the board. So I would I would hope you preserve that uh, in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Leo. Um, Charles, I'll give the floor to you to answer, but just uh, for those less familiar in the evaluation space and to keep this accessible, the IEG, the Independent Evaluation from the World Bank. Go ahead, Charles. Uh, thank you. And a lot of interesting comments and thoughts, um, which you know, very helpful to us. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to give you like solid answers to all of those questions. Uh, and I would e encourage you to the extent that I, I, I don't give satisfactory answers, the follow up, as Anna said at the beginning, but there'll be a, a follow up format so that we can continue the, the conversation. Um, you know, Austin's question, you, you made a very important question about how, how does the fund assess the extent to which countries are actually uh, uh, following their their uh, undertakings through the fund, um, and and how can that be process be used in a in a way that helps to make sure that key protections uh, uh, are, are are key promises are effectively implemented. And this has been very relevant, in fact, for the emergency financing. Uh, as I mentioned, 75 countries have benefited from emergency financing. Emergency financing is very different from the usual way the, the fund lends. Uh, typically, the fund will lend uh, phased over time with reviews every three months, every six months to check whether countries are, are following their undertaking. Uh, so that there is a continuous process of, of, uh, of, of checking uh, and then as you as you mentioned, Austin, there is a, there is in some cases an, an ex post audit or an ex post evaluation. Well, that's only in a limited number of cases with very very large access. Um, but in the case of the emergency financing, these are one off drawings. The idea was to move very quickly because if you have to negotiate a program, then that takes time, and countries needed the funds immediately. They co they couldn't wait for for three months uh, to negotiate a, a program. Um, so the fund moved very quickly, and uh, it, it was aware that there was a need to have some safeguards that the funds were being used effectively. And certainly this was part of the dialogue with countries, what would be the framework that countries used uh, to assure the fund, to assure the international community that the funds were going to be appropriately used. 
uh, I think there have been some strains uh, in this area, uh, as I'm sure you're you're all aware. And the fund has continued to think how to how to how to strengthen those those safeguards um, for for future emergency financing. And uh, I, I think this is that this will definitely be an issue that we will need to look at when we do our own uh, evaluation uh, of the of the funds. Uh, uh, COVID response, you know, take, taking into account uh, the importance of assuring that, that, that there's good governance over the use of funds, but at the same time that, that the fund is able to fulfill countries' needs for, for quick, substantial financing in their hour of need. It's a, it's a, it's a tricky issue. Um, on the issue of, of uh, relationships uh, with uh, other external accountability actors. I mean, our, our closest relationships are with other external evaluation offices, like the IEG at the World Bank. Uh, there is a very active group uh, made up of, of uh, uh, all of the IFI evaluation offices. So we, so we, sh we share experience. Uh, we learn from each other. Um, and I, I, I certainly find that ex extremely useful. But I'm, I'm now interested in trying to take it to the next stage or to see whether we can actually work jointly. Uh, so we did our evaluation funds partnership with the World Bank uh, on, on macro structural issues, but we did that by ourselves. We did it with support from the IEG, from strong support from the IEG, but it was not a joint product. And I, I think it would be interesting to explore ways of, of actually doing joint work. If, if the fund and bank are working together, then the valuation offices should also be find a way of working, working together. Um, you know, Leo, Leo's questions on uh, uh, the uh, the implementation of the recommendations coming out of of our earlier evaluations of crisis response. Um, I frankly. You know, the further back you go in time, the less well specified the implementation plans were. Uh, I think one of the things we've learned is that implementation plans need to be very concrete. Uh, they need to be measurable, that they need to have accountability. Uh, they need to be consistent with incentives. And some of these earlier uh, implementation plans didn't didn't didn't. Uh, uh, meet these criteria, and sometimes the you know the objectives were were very broad, uh, such as uh, you know, uh, increase the funds' uh, ability to listen to outside ideas and reduce groupthink. Um, one important area uh, that principle is measurable is is diversity. One of the, one of the points we made about the funds failure to fully anticipate the risks of a global financial crisis was, was, was that there was a lack of diversity in the fund that, that contributed to groupthink and there was a need to uh, uh, have a more diverse staff in terms of nationality, in terms of gender, in terms of professional educational background. And that, that's one of the areas where the fund has basically said, yes, we need to do that, but progress has been mixed. So this this is one of those actions that's going to be reinforced uh, going ahead. So uh, what exactly will be done remains to be seen. That, that, frankly, the, 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 the COVID emergency has, has delayed some of, some of the important uh, institutional rebuilding work as, as well as delayed devaluation work. But uh, you know, within the next six months or so, the, the fund I think will be will be coming up with further steps to to strengthen diversity, uh, which will I think uh, be helpful from that point of view. Um, let let me stop there, but I'm, you know, I'm happy to continue this conversation uh, with Austin and Leo if you if you want to follow up uh, using uh, Emma's uh, uh, my system. <laughs> your system. <laughs> All right, so next I have uh, Vaclav and one Jiru. One um, so we'll have to, those two questions. And then I have after that another round uh, with John Sword and, and Rose. Um, but please do keep them coming. You know, I'm keen to hear from 
from everyone, but if you do have follow up, um, you know, feel free to, to ask for the floor again as well. Um, so, Vaclav and then one Jiru, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Emma. Uh, organizing session. My name is Vaclav Pusha. I work as a policy advisor for a non governmental thing in Nigeria. Two questions, if I may. Uh, the first one uh, you mentioned that. Uh, um, Sorry, I hope you can hear me well. Yeah. Uh, echo. Um, you mentioned, and we see it actually, that the IMF, uh, you would like to work on the governance, anti corruption. The question I have is how will you strike the balance between the obvious mandate that IMF has to assist state parties, governments, and the necessity that uh, this kind of work will? Uh, for sure raise some very difficult questions. The second question, can you imagine that your department or IMF in some form will work on transparency, accountability of financial support of other lenders? Thank you. Want you? Yes, thank you very much. Um, and I'd like to echo what um, Austin and Leo said. And if you don't mind, just to give, um, we are new to this uh, field um, working on, on debt. And the reason we've come to this is because we work on devolution, we work on um, social accountability, um, and we find that um, uh, national debt has become an impediment to, to the implementation of devolution. And, I think my my big what I'd like to do is just briefly share what brings us here and and you know that is and maybe the question would be the extent to which these are areas that um, will be canvassed or can be canvassed. Um, there's a major disconnect in our view, um, at least in our context, between the IMF's assessment um, of the situation in our country that uh, enabled um, government to borrow and, and our reality um, on the ground. We therefore did reach out to the IMF, we've reached out to the World Bank as well, and um, have begun a conversation. Um, and part of that includes looking at the indicators um, and the extent to which those indicators are responsive or government is actually giving accurate information. Um, and um, the accountability around those indicators to, to citizens. So um, I think there's, you know, we are in a country that is lauded for its transparency, yet we find that um, from where we sit, we have a parliament that's complaining they don't have access to the information they need. So documents are getting published, but those documents don't contain the information needed uh, for debt accountability. So the, the, the disconnects are in, you know, the minute details. So that's one. The second is the disconnect that um, uh, Austin mentioned um, with regard to citizens. Um, in our context, our constitution, best sovereignty in the citizens. Um, debt is an important uh, part of revenue uh, collection, uh, revenue raising, and this process is supposed to be subject to civilian oversight. Now, this is not happening. So much as we really laud and are trying to organize ourselves to, to um, engage in social accountability around COVID, we are saying at the negotiation stage, when decisions are being made, um, or, um, kind of conditions are being set, that also needs to be open. So uh, the last point is, um, we are, and Oxfam has, has a draft report published on this, um, looking at um, debt financing and large infrastructure. Um, and it's pegged in some way to the vision 2030s that had been developed in, in developing countries. And the notion of trickle down, you, know, you build large infrastructure projects and you're going to create development. Um, I think this is an area we are finding not to be the case. And, and possibly an area for further investigation in terms of if countries do borrow, where have these investments yielded um, equitable, sustainable development outcomes as opposed to big, tiny projects that 
uh, good opportunities for, for corruption and, and heighten inequalities and um, restrict uh, local development um, uh, uh, agendas. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Uh, Charles, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, so both Vaslav and Bondu raised very important, interesting points uh, that would certainly be very relevant for future evaluation of fund work on, on debt uh, and on governance issues. Um, and I think that the fund is certainly a, a very much aware of the problems and constraints. And certainly you, you, could, you could look at cases for example, where the fund has put a lot of emphasis on trying to deal with, with corruption issues. Uh, while the fund has to work with the, the government of the country, the fund also has to be satisfied that the government will be using the, the funds in a responsible way uh, and in a way that contributes to the country's macroeconomic success and the broader prosperity of the people of the countries. And you know, there certainly have been cases where the fund has held back resources uh, because it was not satisfied that, that governments were, were meeting these, these conditions. And I think the fund increasingly has given emphasis on these issues because I think there's increasing recognition that corruption and is a, a, a major obstacle to sustained growth. If, if, if uh, investors uh, believe that the returns from their projects are going to be taken, uh, or if consumers and households believe uh, that they are not being treated fairly, uh, or if funds are are diverted away from productive infrastructure and into white elephants, all, all of those things will have negative macroeconomic uh, impacts as, as well as negative impact on, on governance. So the, the fund is certainly trying to, to pay greater attention to these issues. Now, how successful it's been and whether it's going about it the right way, that's, that, those are open questions. Uh, and those are questions that we, we can certainly look at in, in the context of, of an evaluation on, on uh, governance and corruption issues. Uh, similarly, on, on debt issues, uh, there's been a lot of attention recently at the fund and the World Bank on the need for, for transparency and accountability uh, in uh, the way countries borrow uh, and the way in which countries uh, have uh, uh, increased their, their, their indebtedness. Um, I think the, uh, you know, uh, the this is a, a long-standing issue, but it's, it's it's one that's become more important uh, as the sources of financing have shifted to a broader range of private sector financing, broader range of official financing has deepened these problems. So you know, the fund is definitely aware of these issues, but again. Uh, how effective is the fund at, at actually addressing the issues? How does it go about it? Uh, what more can it do? Those are issues that, that we could take up in, in a future evaluation. All right. Um, so then I have, I'm going to take three now because we're, we're getting a little closer to the end. So I have a written question from John Sword, my colleague with Brent Woods Project. And then after that, um, I'll take Rose and Maddie as well. Um, so from John, my colleague, he's asking um, uh, whether the IEO's forthcoming evaluation on the collaboration with the World Bank and, and macrostructural issues makes any specific recommendations on how the IMF should collaborate with the World Bank on climate issues. Um, so especially we're interested in um, whether the IEO is prescribing any specific way of collaborating uh, with the World Bank in surveillance work? Um, and if so, uh, are there implications for the IMF's ongoing comprehensive surveillance review? 
and I'm going to use my chair's privilege as John's colleague as well to add to that uh, related to the same review. Um, as last I heard about this review, it also involved um, looking at IMF uh, collaboration with other organizations, other international institutions, especially like UN organizations. So I'm wondering if that's still included in it and if you could lift a little veil uh, on that, that would be great. Um, so then I'll go to, to Rose. Thanks. Hi, I think. My name is Rose Salbring. I work with Womankind Worldwide and we're a women's rights organization based in the UK, but we work in partnership. Um, we work in partnership um, with women's organizations across the global south. Um, my role is to work on uh, women's economic rights uh, specifically. Um, so thank you so much uh, again for sharing all this information uh, about what you're doing and, and what are the sort of uh, opportunities for conversation going. Um, and I, I wanted to stress um, that considering what has been raised by colleagues already about uh, increase of inequality in, in the COVID crisis, that uh, women are, are uh, disproportionately impacted by the current situation and women um, having um, experiencing multiple intersecting uh, discriminations, uh, so women that are poor or are single mothers, uh, and the like are suffering even more from the current situation and are uh, overrepresented in unpaid care work and uh, care sectors and other sectors that uh, are currently under a lot of pressure and really on the front line uh, in the COVID crises. Um, so my question to you is twofold really. Uh, one is uh, what are your lessons from past crises on uh, encouraging uh, participation of diverse women's rights organizations in uh, the IMF's response. So uh, has that happened and, and were there any lessons drawn on that? Um, and uh, if that was not the case, then I would be uh, extended to the current situation and ask uh, what the IEO itself is planning to do uh, to ensure that diverse women's rights organizations and uh, women's voices are uh, heard within this space um as well as in future evaluation around uh, the covid response that you mentioned and just to acknowledge that uh, i'm speaking here from the uk as a dutch uh, citizen so very much not a diverse uh, voice uh, even though i am working on women's rights thank you very much thanks so much rose for that great question um matty go on yeah i hope you can all hear me uh, thank you for the floor um, so I'm turning to question A, based in the UK. Um, I'd like to ask a question about some of the monitoring issues with uh, the current uh, rapid financing, uh, whether it's rapid financing facility or the extended financing facility. I think our concern there is the uh, conditions, or whether we call them conditions, but the um, narrative that goes along with that support and the subsequent technical support that will no doubt go when those requests come in, that they seem to still prioritize what we would call fiscal austerity under terminology such as fiscal discipline needs to return after the crisis is over or the peak of the crisis is over. We also see language that fiscal consolidation is uh, among the key recommendations and that we tend to understand as reducing public spending at a time when health spending and social protection spending is absolutely vital to keep people alive during and after the crisis. And we also see very recently that uh, the, the fiscal response um, tech advice from the IMF seems to be VAT rate rises. We saw that also after the 2008 financial crisis, VAT rates have risen both in high income countries and in developing countries, while corporate tax rates have gone down and there hasn't been enough action on tackling tax avoidance and illicit financial flows or indeed debt distress. So we really consider that it would be important to kind of monitor what is the comprehensive picture of the loan narrative or is it conditionality? First of all, what is the status of the advice? How binding is the advice? And why is the narrative not shifting to more progressive views, given that we now have an SDG indicator 
the 10.4.2 that says progressive fiscal policy is the way to go in order to reduce inequality. We will be monitoring this space and I hope you could also join us in that um, because I've read the 70 plus rapid finance agreements and that's what I am seeing at the moment. Thank you. Thanks very much, Maddie, for that very important contribution. Um, Charles? Uh, no, thank you. And again, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do, to do justice to, to all of the comments and questions, uh, but, but let me let me uh, give it a shot. Um, you know, on, on the uh, bank fund collaboration uh, evaluation, we, we, we do have recommendations on how to, to strengthen the funds work with the World Bank on on climate and, and other macro structural issues, uh, which will be considered uh, by the board uh, ahead of the comprehensive surveillance review. You're, you're right that actually the comprehensive surveillance review is going to be a very important moment uh, in which the fund can consider uh, its, its experience uh, with surveillance and take into account the lessons that we bring. And so we are evaluation was was time to feed into that process uh, given the delays we've actually advanced we had a we had a preliminary informal discussion with with the board particularly on climate issues given the importance of of climate and the fact that the fund is ramping up its attention to climate um, and we've had further discussions with with staff and in fact it's, it's it's quite encouraging that even though the comprehensive surveillance review is, has been delayed our evaluation has been delayed. I, I, I do already see signs that the fund is beginning to work better with, with the World Bank uh, and uh, learning lessons from our, from our evaluation. For, for example, the, the key lesson is, is the need to agree on an appropriate way of structuring the work. Who is responsible for what? Uh, what are the incentives? What are the timetables? Um, and, and that, I think, is going to be something that needs to be taken up in this, the surveillance review. And one of the problems the fund has, it has this very uh, uh, inflexible annual process called the, the Article 4 consultation. And I, I think people realize that if you're going to work with the bank, which also has its inflexible internal processes, both partners need to find ways to move away from 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 these cumbersome processes to, to, to develop maybe new tools of collaboration that are, are less tied uh, to, uh, to, to pre-existing ways of doing business and, and, and think think fresh thoughts. And I think that's going to be a, a theme of the comprehensive surveillance review. It's not something we are directly involved in, but we've seen early, early work in this direction. So that's, that's encouraging. Uh, and I, I think the comprehensive surveillance review will, will also suggest that it's not just the World Bank. The World Bank is certainly a good, always going to be a very important partner, uh, but other agencies can also play an important role depending on the topic. And I, I mentioned before that for gender, uh, in fact, the fund has been working more with uh, with other uh, well, other agencies than with the World Bank on, on gender, because there's more obvious complementarity. Um, on the issue of, of women's rights, uh, and how women are being affected by by the COVID crisis. Uh, certainly, I, I I I hear your concerns. Uh, we heard similar concerns raised raised right at the beginning of this conversation. I mean, this is something we we can certainly take up in the context of an evaluation of, of the fund's uh, COVID response. Um, in terms of uh, whether the fund has learned lessons from previous crises, um, I mean, frankly. You know, the, the fund's work on gender has picked up substantially, but only over the past five or six years. Um, and I think at the time of the 2008 crisis, not much attention was was paid uh, to to these issues. But I, I think the current crisis is one in which the issues become even more important. But they were certainly important previously. But but you know. The nature of the, the health crisis and of women's and the way women are being affected as 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 frontline workers but, and also as, as uh, the, the 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 risks of 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 working from home but these are issues which are certainly interesting and, and very relevant um, on uh, the, the point about fiscal discipline and the, 
the hinge towards consolidation. Um, this is a point that you know, echoes a point I made earlier that one of the lessons from the global financial crisis that the fund was too uh, uh, ready to endorse a rapid pivot towards fiscal consolidation before the global economy was especially robust. And that had a number of, of adverse consequences. Uh, my impression that, that at least in terms of the talk, uh, if you listen to the managing director, uh, in fact, they, she issued a blog just yesterday, uh, Kristalina Georgieva and Vita Gopinath, uh, which I, I think actually pretty much warned against a too rapid shift towards consolidation and, and the need uh, to be more, more patient uh, for all the reasons that, 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 that you give. Now, it's one thing to do a blog, and it's another thing to actually deliver that in the context of, of say, financial programs with, with countries. Uh, so that's something that, 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 we can, that we can check. It's not just a matter of talking the talk, you also have to walk the walk. So I, I, we have that concern, you have that concern. That's something that, that, we, will, that we will want to, to look at. Okay, well, we're nearing the end of the session and I don't see any more hands raised. So I'm going to take the last minute <laughs> to follow up actually on, on that uh, last conversation. And just to say that, I, I, Charles, I think you're completely right in, in identifying this difference between the blogs and what Maddie is seeing in the, in the emergency financing uh, language, but also in some of the the new uh, regular loan programs that are coming out with the regular conditionality, we are seeing this very rapid and rigid um, return to fiscal austerity that many of us are, are very concerned about. Um, so I think um, for the way I would I would phrase it, sort of reflecting on your your question in the beginning in in your presentation in, in how the IEO can can um, approach the the IMF's response to COVID. I think it's very critical that the IEO doesn't just look at the emergency financing phase from sort of, you know, March to June, that very critically it also in, in one way or another looks at the medium to long term responses that are already starting to come out, you know, in actual um, program documents, um, as well as, which would be great, um, looking at how IMF policy before the COVID crisis has, um, you know, uh, perhaps exacerbated or, or helped put us in the situation that, that we are in today. I think that's uh, how I would phrase it. <laughs> but um, we have, so our time is up for today, but as I mentioned there, uh, we are going to share this form. I'll share it uh, right now in the chat for those of you that are very keen to look at that immediately, <laughs> um, but um, it would be great if um, if you do want to have a look at that form and fill it in, uh, that you can do that in the next week or so, so, so we have a sense of when people um, are finished completing it. It, you know, it gives you space to, to comment, ask questions about anything that Charles raised today, but also um, just a general space for you to, to add anything else you might you might like to, to discuss. Um, and for full disclosure and transparency, um, the answers will go to the, the IEO, um, but I will be able to see them as well because I helped facilitate um, the, the form. Um, so I think that's it for today. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Charles. Charles, well, just, do you just, want to? Just one, one final word. Uh, uh, thank you, Emma, for, for, for hosting this and moderating. Uh, I really appreciate the chance to interact with with you all. Uh, I, I've certainly learned a lot. It's given us given us a lot of ideas and, and suggestions and concerns to take up in in the future. Um, and I, I also think this this format uh, is is a good one. Um, and you know, certainly we would be open to repeating uh, this sort of event in the future. So I mean, maybe one of the things you could would you would you fill in uh, the, the, the feedback form is, is to give feedback on the, on the format of this meeting and how, how we, what's the best way for us to engage with you uh, going ahead. 
um, what 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 you know what what again we we need to be learned from our experience and think of ways that we ourselves can do better. And one of the important things for us is to engage effectively uh, with civil society. So any advice you could give on that front would be, be greatly appreciated. So good to see you all. Thanks thanks very much. Thanks so much, Charles. Thanks everybody for your input. Thanks, Charles. Thanks, Emma. Look okay. forward to next time. <laughs> Thank you.